Warning, this episode contains graphic details of violence committed against a young child and material that may not be suited for some audiences. Listener discretion is advised. If I were to ask you, what are some of the things you are most afraid of? We all have fears, right? Some people are afraid of things like snakes or spiders or clowns or even dogs or cats. Some people have fears of things like being afraid of heights or afraid to fly or a fear of small places or crowds. We have some relatively common fears like the fear of public speaking or a fear of elevators or a fear of thunder or lightning, possibly a fear of being alone. We're afraid of things that are unknown to us or make us feel vulnerable, like being afraid of dying or afraid of the dark, a fear of falling, ghosts, zombies. Some people are afraid of commitment or intimacy or have a fear of failure or a fear of abandonment or a fear of being forgotten. I have some irrational fears. I'm afraid of spiders and most bugs actually. When I was younger, I used to be afraid of the dark and afraid of noises I would hear outside. And that's a fear that's kind of carried over into my adulthood. I'm somewhat afraid of going places alone at night, something I don't really do very often. When I was little, I was afraid of the Night Stalker, Richard Ramirez. And that basically expanded to just about any serial killer. As you can see, I'm getting on into my 12th episode of California Dreaming, and I have yet to tell the tale of any serial killers, and California has had their fair share. I'm not going to say that I'm never going to tell any serial killer stories. I'm just not quite ready to go there yet. However, now, if I'm ever asked what my biggest fear is, I have an answer that's always first on my list. It seems silly now to be afraid of the dark or afraid of something superstitious like Friday the 13th. I usually answer that question with this. I'm afraid of something terrible happening to my daughter. I'm afraid of her getting hurt or heaven forbid her preceding me in death. Those are by far and away my biggest fears in life. All the dads and moms out there probably share the same sentiment. All of my other fears are a distant second to this. And if I were to ask you to think about the single most terrifying moment of your life, what would that be? I've had some scary moments when my dad died of a massive heart attack. That was a big one. Or when my grandma was very, very sick and was in the hospital for a few months before she passed away. That was another. I've had a couple of car accidents and those are pretty scary, but I've been lucky to have never really been hurt. These events are relatively commonplace. They're scary in the moment and you cope with it. You find comfort from your family and your loved ones. And time passes and the fear subsides and we keep pressing forward in life. People are amazing beings in their abilities to cope and heal from traumatic events. There is one scary moment that makes all my other scary moments in life feel like a walk in the park. It was so traumatizing that for me, I can still feel the world around me like it was moving in slow motion in those moments. Just about 10 years ago, My parents, my daughter, who was seven at the time, and myself, we went on a family vacation to Hawaii for about a week. We were in some kind of marketplace in Honolulu, sort of like a swap meet, and there were a bunch of freestanding shops and food places, and we were having lunch in this big open market type of place. We were all sitting there at a picnic-style table eating lunch when my mom said that she needed a plastic bag to take some food to go. And for some reason, my daughter jumped up and volunteered to get her bag and so quickly took off, disappearing into the crowd. I was pushing my way through the crowds, yelling her name, trying to find her. And I kept having these horrific scenarios running through my head. I was so desperate and I couldn't find her. I couldn't find a security guard. 
I kept thinking I'm never leaving Oahu. I'll be here forever looking for my little girl. And after about 15 minutes, she suddenly reappeared in front of me with a plastic bag in her hand. So proud of herself. She's lucky that I was so relieved to find her because in the next moment, I felt myself wanting to kill her for putting me through that. I don't know if I can even begin to convey how unbelievably terrifying those 15 minutes were. If you've lost your child in a crowd, then you feel me. I get crazy freaked out when I think about it, but I was lucky. Apparently she knew what she was doing, so my bad for the freak out, right? Anyway, that's my biggest fear, losing my child. I never want to experience the trauma or the sadness of losing her. She's my whole world. I needed to be better in that moment in Oahu. It was my job to keep her safe. It's our job as parents to keep our babies safe. But what if we don't? What if in a careless moment we fail? A moment we weren't paying attention. A moment we were too caught up in our own lives. What if in that tiny, tiny window of time, something slips past as our guard is down? And everything goes wrong and something terrible happens to our child. Something completely unexpected. Something that never should have happened, but it did. Because in that moment, your child came to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and it was under your watch. I touched on this very subject back in episode seven when I was talking about my friend whose daughter was struck by a pickup truck in a Costco parking lot. That was an accident, but I admittedly placed some of the responsibility upon her for not keeping a watchful eye on her child while traversing the lot. But what if it's something worse? Worse than being run over in a parking lot because your parent was distracted or wasn't holding your hand? Yeah, worse than that. I am so struggling with this particular story because as much as I hate, hate, hate on the perpetrator who is at the center of this tale, I'm also super filled with anger towards his friend who stood by and didn't say or do anything to prevent this awful crime from occurring. I've also found myself being so angry and finger pointy at the parent of the victim. Yes, the parent of the child in this story, because I feel so badly and so strongly that he failed his child in the worst ways possible. I don't wanna feel this way. I want to feel sympathy for this man. I want to so badly. And this story is now 20 years old and I want to somehow feel that this wasn't any part his fault. He didn't do this to his baby. A stranger did. But maybe I'm not alone in how I feel. And maybe you guys out there listening to this Maybe you guys can help me see this differently. Maybe you can help me validate my feelings. Because when I tell you what this little baby girl's dad did that led her to the situation that she found herself in, maybe you can help me or maybe we can help each other try to wrap our minds around this, wrap our hearts around it and wrap our souls around this because this is the tale of our worst nightmare. Cherise Marche Renee Iverson was born October 20th, 1989 in Los Angeles, California to parents Yolanda Manuel and Leroy Iverson. Cherise and her half-brother Harold were living with their father. As Cherise's mother was trying to go through the court system to try to gain custody, I had a very difficult time finding any information about Charisse's life through my research. I tried searching for her mother, Yolanda, and I found a Facebook page that I was fairly certain was her, but it was really hard to tell, honestly. There were no references to Charisse 
from what I could see. With a tremendous amount of deliberation, I decided to send this Yolanda a message. I explained to her that she doesn't know who I am, but I was interested in telling her daughter's story on the show. That I wasn't sure if she was the same person that I was looking for, and just that her name matched, and if she wasn't the mother of the child that I was wanting to speak with, then I apologized for bothering her. However, if she was, in fact, the mother, and she did not wish to speak to me, I again apologized for bothering her, and I completely understood, considering the circumstances. I didn't hear back from her. I searched, and I tried looking for any personal memorial pages, dedicated pages, or anything that wasn't news-related, but I could not find anything. As for Charisse's father, Leroy, he passed away in 2000, so I'm unable to tell you any more than her name, Charisse, and I might have a little bit of information from some news articles, but that was about it. Born October 20th, 1989, and her life ended May 25th, 1997. During that Memorial Day weekend, Leroy Iverson found himself in Prim, Nevada, a town just inside the Nevada side of the state's border with California, located on Interstate 15, the main artery that takes Southern Californians to and from Nevada. 40 miles southwest of the city of Las Vegas, there is a small cluster of casinos, restaurants, gas stations, and an outlet mall. It's one of those places you're thrilled to see after driving through seemingly endless stretches of desert as you're excitedly headed to Vegas. And it's your last chance to try your luck on the slots or at the tables or stop for a bite to eat before you make your way back home to Southern California. Mr. Iverson had traveled to the border resort with his 14-year-old son, Harold, and his seven-year-old daughter, Charisse. At the time, there were three major casinos located at this resort, Whiskey Pete's, Buffalo Bill's, and the Prima Donna. The first two casinos, Whiskey Pete's and Buffalo Bill's, are still there. The Prima Donna has been renamed Prim Valley Resort. But at the time that today's story takes place, it was called the Prima Donna, so we will call it that for the purposes of this story. Mr. Iverson had been gambling late into the night on May 24th at Buffalo Bill's Casino. He had allowed his children to play unsupervised around the casino and in the arcade area. He was asked repeatedly by casino security personnel to please keep a watch of his children. Security had found Cherise playing alone and paged her family through the public address system in Buffalo Bill's for someone to come retrieve this little girl. Her brother came and got her. Her brother was admonished to better supervise his little sister, and he had also been warned to stay out of the gaming areas of the casino. Security finally decided to seek out the children's father, and when they did, they asked Mr. Iverson to leave the casino for refusing to properly supervise his children. This was shortly before 1.30 in the morning. Mr. Iverson, apparently not done gambling yet, made his way over to the Prima Donna, which is directly across the street from Buffalo Bills. Apparently, Mr. Iverson did not make any attempts to better supervise his children at this casino either. According to Las Vegas authorities, he left his daughter unattended repeatedly between the hours of 1.30 a.m. and 3.48 a.m., which is the exact time Charisse was last seen alive on video surveillance entering a women's restroom. Throughout the course of this episode, I will talk about Mr. Iverson, Charisse's mother, Yolanda Manuel, the other people involved in the crime that took place that night, as well as the other issues that arose regarding casino safety and resorts in Nevada, fashioning themselves into family-friendly travel destinations. While Mr. Iverson was busy gambling away the night, Charisse had been playing in the Prima Donna Resort's video arcade. 
This was one of Mr. Iverson's favorite travel destinations, a place where he could gamble and his kids could be relatively occupied. From the 15, when you drive by, you can see a big roller coaster outside of Buffalo Bills. It's obviously a place that not only offers gambling for the adults, but some fun things for the kids to do too, right? I've stayed at Buffalo Bills and there are definitely things for young kids, but not so much at the hours that Charisse was there playing. The rides are all closed by that time of night. I'm not certain if the arcade closes at a certain hour now, but when she was there, apparently it was a 24 hour thing. The prima donna doesn't offer the kinds of rides that Buffalo Bills does, but they do have those arcades. Buffalo Bills arcade is at the casino level, but the one across the street at the prima donna was one level below the casino floor. At Buffalo Bills, there's an area for children that's past several restaurants, so kids are free to roam around without breaking Nevada's laws regarding persons under 21 years of age not being allowed in the gaming area. If you've been to Nevada and visited any of their casinos, you know this law is very strictly enforced. There are not only security guards constantly roaming the gaming areas, there are also floor personnel that keep their eyes on the table games the gamblers, the dealers, and they also keep any children from loitering in the gaming areas and keep them moving along. Often in casinos, the carpet is color-coded to be clear where children are not allowed to be. So for the arcade to be located in an obscure area of the resort, like the lower levels or closer to the areas leading away from the casino and into the hotel wings, makes perfect sense. No matter what casino it is, children are simply not allowed to be left unattended anywhere. Not even in the arcades. There are signs everywhere reminding casino guests that children under the age of 17 need to be accompanied by an adult. How well these regulations are enforced, especially when it comes to older kids and teenagers who are often allowed to go off and do their own thing while their parents gamble, is anybody's guess. I know, growing up 275 miles from Las Vegas and being an only child, I often found myself in many a casino arcades, but not at the age of seven. My parents would bring along a babysitter when we traveled to Vegas, or they would take turns spending time with me while the other gambled. And once I reached a certain age, I was allowed to go play in the kid-designated areas on my own. Never did I really think I was ever in any kind of danger, and I don't know if my parents ever really thought that either, but I do know that I needed to check in with either my mom or my dad at very specific times. That wasn't hard because I would definitely run out of quarters for the games pretty quickly. So Mr. Iverson, leaving his child with her 14-year-old brother to wander around the casino for nearly four hours after 1.30 in the morning? Is that something that one would consider to be typical behavior for a parent? I know I wasn't wandering around in a casino at that hour. For as long as I can remember, anything available for children to do at that hour of the morning was closed for the night. But apparently not at this casino. Not that night, I guess. Mr. Iverson was going to try his luck with his gambling and with his kids. I mean, what could go wrong, right? His kids are safe, aren't they? She's with her big brother. She'll be fine. This is a fun little border resort. It's probably the last place Mr. Iverson would think his children's lives would be in any danger. I don't know. What about you guys? Maybe it's because of the story that I feel this way, but seriously... I would never in a million years have allowed my child to roam in a casino on her own at any age. I've been to Vegas countless times, and it might just be because I'm not a gambler, but I've always found myself in the arcade with my daughter. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think I could say with nearly 100% certainty that my kid has never been in a Vegas casino 
any area of a Vegas casino without adult supervision. Maybe things would be different if I gambled, but even if I did, I wouldn't have sent her off to the arcades without me. And I'm certain most of you share the same sentiment. It's just bad judgment. And even if you aren't familiar with the story, you just know, because I'm talking about the story on the show, that this is not going to end well. And you know and I know that this tale is likely the exact reason why we don't let our kids out of our sights. So there was Charisse playing in the arcade well after 1.30 in the morning on that Sunday before Memorial Day. Much of what transpired in the arcade was documented on surveillance camera. So many hours passed before Mr. Iverson had any kind of inclination to check in on his kids in the arcade. I have so many strong opinions about this, but as I weave through the details of this story, I have to keep reminding myself to remember who committed the most atrocious crime imaginable in this story. Maybe we can have a discussion about it after the show goes live. It makes me so angry to think about it. But let me go through this and I will try to keep it together as best I can. But I would love to hear all of your opinions as well. Am I being too hard on dad? You tell me when the story is over. At exactly 3.48 a.m., little Cherise can be seen going into the women's restroom in the arcade. You can find these images, possibly even a video on YouTube, or a link to various articles about this story online. But I'll post some pictures on social media. They're in black and white, and they're somewhat grainy, frame-by-frame -frame shots, each one time-stamped. But you can see the people involved in this pretty clearly. You can see Cherise run past some video games, and beyond the views of cameras. They're the last images of her ever captured. What happens next is so eerie to watch, so haunting. You see a young white man, possibly in his late teens or early 20s, wearing a t-shirt, some light colored shorts, and a baseball cap worn backwards following Cherise into the bathroom. You can also see another young white man hovering around just outside the bathroom door, kind of pacing or loitering there. I'll talk a lot more about him later in the story too. He's another person who could have changed the course of what happened, but didn't. 25 minutes later at 4.13 a.m., the black and white time stamped grainy still images show the young man with the backwards baseball cap leaving the women's restroom. Cherise still has not reappeared, as I've told you. She never will. 45 minutes later, at 4.58 a.m., Mr. Iverson is seen on the video images looking for Cherise. More than three hours after arriving at the prima donna, it finally occurs to him that it might be a good idea to check in on his kids. More than three hours later. She's seven years old. It's between 1.30 and 5 in the morning in a casino, a casino at which Mr. Iverson has no hotel reservation, so he knows his kids aren't safely tucked in a bed somewhere, that's for sure. So suddenly at five in the morning, Mr. Iverson has that holy crap moment he can't find Cherise. He searches around the arcade looking for her, and when he can't seem to find her, he asks a female hotel employee to take a look in the lady's restroom for him, which she does, and what she finds is a parent's worst nightmare come true. Seven-year-old Cherise, little Cherise, is dead in a bathroom stall. On the surveillance video, you can see a horrified casino employee grabbing Mr. Iverson and pulling him into the bathroom. Charisse's body was discovered in the handicapped stall. 
propped up in a seated position on the toilet. The second grader at 75th Street Elementary School in Los Angeles, described as a sweet, loving child, had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. I will get into Mr. Iverson's behavior that night, leaving his children to play unsupervised at that hour in the arcade while he gambled all morning long, and the casino security personnel releasing Charisse into the care of her older but still 14-year-old brother. I first want to tell you about the man who was responsible for doing this to Charisse, Jeremy Strohmeyer just 18 years old when he murdered and raped her. And his friend, David Cash, 17 years old at the time, who knew what was happening and did nothing to stop it. From all appearances, Jeremy Strohmeyer was an all around good kid. He was a student at Woodrow Wilson High School in Long Beach, California. Like many high schools, the students were divided into cliques, surfers, jocks, druggies, and the sort of dorky kids. Strohmeyer started at Wilson midway through his junior year in 1996. He had spent a year in Singapore prior to this, where his mom had taken a job with a computer company. Upon returning to Long Beach, Strohmeyer initially fit in with the dorky guys, but without really having to work hard at it, he easily kept up a 3.5 GPA, immersing himself in advanced placement classes with the hopes of one day being accepted to West Point or to the Air Force Academy. By the time he was in 10th grade, he had the ability to build his own computer. He enjoyed writing poetry and he had a deep passion for flying, a passion he shared with his dad. Compared to the other kids at Wilson High, Strohmeyer's family was quite well to do, with an income into the six-figure level. This kid had everything going for him. So much potential, nice home, nice cars, nice vacations. It just goes to show that anybody can turn into a monstrous pedophile rapist murderer because that's all he's amounted to. Strohmeyer began acting out in Singapore. He took up drinking and started mouthing off and talking back to his parents, who prior to this considered him the apple of their eye, him and his sister. Anyone who knew him prior to murdering Charisse could have seen him doing something great with his life. But in the year and a half at Wilson High, leading up to his sexually assaulting and killing Charisse, he was kind of living a double existence. He hid his drinking and druggies from his parents, He hid the fact that he was adopted from his friends. And from everyone, he hid the fact that he had a collection of child pornography and a secret desire for a girlfriend who would dress up like a little schoolgirl for him in a uniform and pigtails. He compartmentalized these various aspects of himself so well that nobody really knew who he really was. Nobody knew his secrets. By the time he was a senior, if he was going through a slump, His friends would just chalk it up to senioritis. His parents would just think he's going through a phase. Who would have thought how deeply disturbed this guy really was? He hid things really well. Of course, his friends knew that he partied hard and often drank too much. Apparently, lots of kids do. But when he drank, it seems Strohmeyer had a particularly violent temper that would come over him without any warning. One classmate recalled a time that he had too much to drink and spit in the face of one of his classmates. There was another time when he was asked to leave a party because of his belligerent behavior, and so he spewed off a string of profanities at the party host before leaving. Are these things red flags? I don't know. Nobody expects their foul-mouthed, bad-tempered friend to go off the rails and murder children. Nobody thinks that. Real trouble had started for Strohmeyer a little less than a year earlier in June of 1996 when he was arrested for a DUI. When his mother picked him up from the police station, Strohmeyer flew into a rage. 
He began punching the car windows, and his mother was so afraid of her son that she stopped the car and made him get out. He slept on the beach that night. And he knew in that moment that that DUI was going to prevent him from being able to get into West Point or the Air Force Academy. He lost his driver's license. He had to attend alcohol counseling and perform 80 hours of community service. He knew the course of his life would never be the same. And things could not have happened at a worse time. He had just met a girl who he had been courting up until this time. She was just about to start attending UC Santa Barbara that fall. Without his driver's license, he wasn't going to be able to visit her like the two had been planning from the time that they met that spring. And as for Strohmeyer's parents, from what I could glean, they were either completely in the dark or completely in denial. And if I were to guess, my money's on denial. When they had tried to re-enroll Strohmeyer back into the school he was in in Singapore because his mother was going to return there for work, the school rejected him. What they were told on his last day there in the previous year, that he had shown up to school stoned. His parents didn't believe the school administrators. They could see their son's behavior was changing for the worse while they had been in Singapore, but they blamed it on being in Singapore. They figured coming back to Long Beach would solve all their problems. They attributed most of their son's behavior to teenage angst. So fast forward to Memorial Day weekend, 1997. Strohmeyer had gone along with his friend, David Cash, and his father to Las Vegas. They had made what was supposed to be a brief stop at the prima donna, but for Cash's dad, like many gamblers, got caught up at the poker tables. By three in the morning, Strohmeyer and Cash were getting really bored hanging around the arcade as they waited for Cash's dad. Who knew when the guy was going to be done with his gambling? So these two bored morons decided it would be funny to urinate on two coin-operated games. And then they thought it would be even more funny to urinate on an electrical wall outlet. The two of them must have thought this was the funniest thing ever. As stupid as this whole scene sounds, I wish this was the worst of what was going to happen that early morning. Strohmeyer, with his dumb backwards hat, tried striking up a conversation with a 16-year-old girl he met in the arcade. He flashed a fake ID that he used to buy Coke and whiskeys. He had some piercings he wanted to show off, stuck out his tongue, which was pierced with a steel rod, and then he lifted up his shirt to show off some nipple piercings. Now, if you're thinking, wow, this guy's a creep, don't worry, you're not the only one. The girl he was talking to thought so, too. She managed to sidestep giving him her pager number. Remember those things? And she lied to him about where she lived. Well, as the two were talking, Strohmeyer was suddenly hit by a wet, wadded-up piece of paper towel. By 3.30 that Sunday morning, in the casino arcade, Charisse was starting to get tired, and of course, she was restless. Anyone with a seven-year-old would be well aware of this, and most of us would not be having our children running around a casino arcade unattended at this time of night. I cannot speak of my disdain for this enough. I almost wouldn't believe a parent would have allowed this to happen if this story never occurred and ended the way that it did. Despite having his children escorted to him twice by security, told he could not leave them unsupervised, repeatedly told by security to keep his eyes on his children, Mr. Iverson, apparently hell-bent on gambling, paid no mind to casino security. His children were getting tired and impatient. They kept approaching their father as he played at the slots, a place his children were not allowed to be. He yelled at them, 
three times to get back down into the arcade until he came for them. After the last time, Mr. Iverson yelled and threatened them not to return to the slot area. The two kids stayed downstairs in the arcade. At one point during those three hours that Charisse was down in the arcade, she had actually fallen asleep in the seat of a racing car game. She'd apparently been to the prima donna many times before, so she was familiar with the routine. So who was Charisse's dad? Well, at the time, he was a 58-year-old retired bus driver, and his health was not good. He needed a cane to walk steadily. He suffered from asthma attacks, high blood pressure. He had emphysema and diabetes. Back home in Los Angeles, he didn't allow Charisse to play outside of their apartment complex because he felt it was too dangerous. The Prima Donna, a pretty white building with Victorian-style architecture with an immaculately manicured landscaping was a place that he apparently felt he could allow his children to roam free, safe and secure. And Charisse's mom? Her name is Yolanda Manuel. She didn't come on this trip with her daughter and Mr. Iverson. Their relationship was a unique one to say the least. The couple had fought about two weeks prior to Mr. Iverson's trip to Nevada and she had moved out of the apartment they had shared and in with her sister. When Miss Manuel met Mr. Iverson, he was 45 and she was a 15-year-old high schooler. He was a single dad with an infant son. And so when Miss Manuel was 16, she moved in with him. When she became pregnant at 16, she ended up dropping out of high school. Whatever it was that drew the couple together in the beginning, one can only speculate, but if I were to guess, I'd say Mr. Iverson was likely looking for a young girl to be with and possibly help him take care of his infant son. And for Miss Manuel, I would guess she was looking to get away from her family and meet a man that could take care of her. And Mr. Iverson was able to provide that for her. Eventually, their relationship began to fracture as Miss Manuel got older. They slept in separate rooms. They even had separate refrigerators. Their fights were intense. Even once, Miss Manuel smashed the windows of Mr. Iverson's truck, and he ended up taking her to court, making accusations of her being a violent alcoholic. Mr. Iverson also had a history of tragic stories when it came to his children, not even including Charisse's death. Prior to that, he had had a two-month-old son that died of sudden infant death syndrome in 1996. He had a premature child born in 1988 that died of respiratory failure, and then another child died of acute meningitis at the age of 17 months. Mr. Iverson had been visited by Los Angeles County social workers several times in order to investigate child abuse allegations. However, none of those claims were ever substantiated. After the death of his third child, social workers made almost 60 visits to his home as a part of a program to help him keep his family together and better his parenting skills. By all accounts, Mr. Iverson doted on Cherise. He dropped her off at school in the morning, on time, every single day, and picked her up on time, almost always 20 minutes early, as a matter of fact, so she did not have to wait for him. No other father in the South Central Los Angeles area school did that. Cherise's teachers described her as affectionate and kind and trusting. She always came to school, well-kept, her hair always neatly braided, her clothes always clean and pressed. The second grader did struggle with reading. She was afraid of the dark. Her favorite color was purple, and she loved to jump rope. And her favorite movie was The Little Mermaid. She had aspirations to be a nurse or a police officer. It's undeniable 
little Cherise was a very special little girl. Apparently, Mr. Iverson was skeptical of babysitters, too. So whenever he went to the Nevada border to gamble, he always took Cherise and Harold. This was his favorite family activity. But to me, it feels more like a Mr. Iverson activity. On this particular trip, it was Memorial Day weekend and he was anxious to get to the border town of Prim. They left the Los Angeles area sometime after 8 p.m. that Saturday evening. Without stopping, without traffic, and maybe even speeding a little bit, you can make it from L.A. to the border in under four hours. They got to the border resort around midnight. He gave his kids each $5 and shooed them off to the arcade while he made his way to the slots. You all know the rest. What about Strohmeyer? What's his story? Well, his parents at the time that all of this happened had been married for 28 years. I told you a little bit about their situation. They live a relatively comfortable life. His father was a general manager of a manufacturing firm and his mother was a human resources director and consultant. They met in the late 60s and married in 1970. They had this plan. They were going to have one biological child and one adopted child. And while they waded through the red tape of the adoption process, they had their one child in 1976, a daughter. By 1980, the couple were finally approached by an adoption counselor with pictures of a baby boy named Gerald Paul. He was 18 months old. His foster parents wanted him, but they were considered to be too old to adopt him. The Strohmeyers immediately fell in love with the baby and went forward with the adoption and renamed him Jeremy Joseph. In researching Strohmeyer's background, I found out that they explained to him that he was indeed adopted when he was four years old. They kind of kept in touch with the foster parents and visited with them on holidays. I thought four was kind of young to tell him this kind of news, but they wanted to explain who these other people were in his life. As Strohmeyer got older, he often talked about wanting to find his birth mother. He wanted her to be a part of their family. At the time, his parents had no idea who his birth parents were. It wasn't until after their son's encounter with Sharice Iverson at the Prima Donna Resort did they find out about the troubling background of his biological family. They found out their adopted son had two other siblings. Both of them were adopted out too, an older half-brother and a younger full brother, who himself also struggles with behavioral issues. Strohmeyer's biological father had spent much of the 10 years leading up to 1997 in and out of California prisons for drug-related charges. Strohmeyer's biological mother was a drug addict. When she gave birth to him, she was a teenager, confined to a psychiatric ward at a county hospital, having been deemed unable to care for herself. She had been diagnosed as a schizophrenic and spent the better part of the last 11 years committed to California state hospitals. According to court records, she had been committed to state hospitals no less than 70 times and had also been diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder and dipsomnia, a form of alcohol dependence. And so, the lives of Cherie Syverson and Jeremy Strohmeyer intersected at that very early hour in the morning of May 25, 1997, when Cherise pelted Strohmeyer with a wet, wadded-up piece of paper towel. Strohmeyer engaged in the horseplay with Cherise, getting some wadded-up paper towels to toss back at the seven-year-old. I imagine that Cherise went to the ladies' room to retrieve more paper towels, Strohmeyer watched her go into the restroom, and a few seconds later, he would follow her in. His friend, David Cash, followed as well, curious as to what his friend was up to. I'll tell you more about this guy, Cash, later also. He's another individual involved in this story that makes me really angry and frustrated. Cash would later state that he saw his friend near the door and Charisse was at the other end of the restroom. 
They both had wadded up paper towels in their hands and as Strohmeyer started to move towards Cherise and likely thinking that he was going to pelt her with his paper towels, she picked up a yellow wet floor sign and threw it at him, grazing him on the arm. Later, Strohmeyer would say that when Cherise hit him with that sign, he snapped and just lost it. He would say, quote, it's like, like, when she swung that thing at me, I don't know, like, I suddenly reacted, unquote. Yeah, reacted, whatever. So he charges towards Cherise and picked her up with his left arm between her legs and his right hand over her mouth. He carried her into the handicap stall and locked the door behind him. All the while, Cash, Mr. Bystander, is bystanding, watching his friend take this little child into the stall and lock it. Later on, he would report that he felt what he described as a small degree of concern. He went into the stall next to the one that Strohmeyer had taken Cherise into, stood on the toilet, and tried to get his friend's attention by tapping him on the head. But he did not acknowledge Cash's feeble attempts at getting his attention. Cash witnessed Charisse's struggle. As his friend had a firm grip on the little girl, she was squirming and trying to scream and trying to get away. He put his hand over her mouth to stop her from screaming, and according to Cash, he told her repeatedly to shut up or he would kill her. Cash would later tell a grand jury that he tried to tell Strohmeyer to let go of Charisse and that he was trying to get him to come out of the restroom. He would state that he could tell at that point the little game that they had been playing kind of crossed the line. You think? He said he tapped him on the head and he even knocked his hat off, but he just looked up at Cash, peering over the stall and... Strohmeyer kind of had this stare, a stare that seemed to look right through him, and he could tell his friend didn't care what he was saying to him, and then he would state he left the bathroom. He claims he didn't know what to think, that maybe something bad was going to happen, but he thinks he probably feared the worst, but really didn't know what to do. So... You're probably asking yourself, what is the deal with Strohmeyer and Cash? How did these two dipshits end up best friends? The kind of best friends that would look the other way while you're raping and strangling a seven-year-old to death? Well, after Strohmeyer turned 18, he became belligerent as his life began spinning out of control. He wasn't abiding by his parents' rules. He wasn't listening to his friends or his teachers or his coaches. He was using methamphetamines and drinking pretty heavily. He was becoming very destructive. He would go to parties and trash houses, throwing beer bottles and kicking holes in walls. There was one incident it's one of those things we find to be a common behavior in serial killers and the like. And I'm going to apologize for the next portion of the story as it involves animal cruelty. You can fast forward for the next 30 seconds, but here it goes. At a house party, he stole a kitten that belonged to one of the homeowners and snuck it into his pocket. And when he and his friends drove away, he threw the kitten out the window. Yeah, this guy was really turning into a piece of shit. He fought with his parents constantly. He'd tell his friends that his mom was such a bitch and his dad was such an asshole. He would write letters to his girlfriend who was away at college and tell her how much he hated them. And in addition to all of this, he would spend hours on the computer in his room, 
visiting porn sites, and he had almost a thousand files containing pictures and videos depicting child pornography, among other disgusting and perverse things. He'd oversleep constantly and frequently missed morning classes. And the ones he did show up to, he would doze off. He started missing sports practices. Every aspect of his life started slipping. He also became increasingly preoccupied with his girlfriend who was away at college. She started to see him as being quite self-destructive. He'd have violent outbursts. He would bang his head into the doors and walls. She stated that he would start with trying to hurt himself and the more he drank, the more he wanted to hurt other people. He would get into fights over nothing. When he was drunk, he was very easily agitated and driven to extreme levels of anger very quickly. The more she started to pull away, the more he clung to her. She eventually dropped out of college and moved away to Maryland and joined the army. Strohmeyer's grades began to suffer. He did not qualify for the ROTC scholarship that he was hoping for, but he didn't tell his parents right away. As you can tell, something had to give eventually. More and more, Strohmeyer was hanging out with his buddy, David Cash, a fellow senior who had aspirations of becoming a nuclear engineer. Most of Strohmeyer's friends didn't like Cash. They thought he was nerdy and arrogant. But for Strohmeyer, he was the perfect best friend. Cash looked up to Strohmeyer. He kind of idolized the guy. For what reasons, I have no idea. He would laugh at his jokes. He didn't pass judgment on him or make fun of him or give him a hard time for pining after a girl who didn't want to be with him anymore. Cash was like Strohmeyer's goofy sidekick. And even better, Cash was always able to drive the unlicensed Strohmeyer anywhere he wanted to go around in his mom's cool red convertible. By February of 1997, Strohmeyer's coach was on to his drug use, but did not make the accusation outright. He brought up his erratic behaviors and spotty attendance. Strohmeyer apologized for letting the team down but it was too late. He was kicked off the volleyball team. In March of 1997, Strohmeyer's girlfriend was in town from the East Coast. She came by to see him and his mother ended up catching the two having sex in the house. She demanded his girlfriend leave and forbid her from ever coming into their home again. This devastated him, so he decided he could no longer live there if his girlfriend wasn't allowed. He ended up moving in with Jeremy Phillips, a friend who graduated a year earlier from Wilson High School. They became friends after meeting at a party. He enjoyed drinking and partying just as much as Strohmeyer did. Strohmeyer, Cash, and Phillips hung out a lot, causing a lot of trouble as they cruised around Long Beach. They'd harass prostitutes and homeless people. One time Strohmeyer smashed an egg into the face of a prostitute. On another occasion, the three took turns shooting a BB gun at homeless people. Phillips would later justify their behavior, saying they wouldn't really aim for people's faces and they never shot at women. Classy guys, right? And if you didn't think that this could get any worse, you'd be wrong. These guys did this thing called whore dragging. This is where they would talk to a prostitute at their car window then grab her by the arm, and the driver would speed off, towing her along the street until they decided to let go. I absolutely despise these jerks. Seriously, in researching this, this is the first time I've ever heard of these type of activities, and I hate these guys so hard right now, it's infuriating. Strohmeyer ended up having to move back home because his roommate was leaving town, and he wouldn't be able to keep up with the rent. Strohmeyer's parents laid down some strict rules, but that obviously wasn't going to help keep him off the path that he was headed down. By April, his girlfriend was done with him. She had discharged from the army early for reasons I could not find, but 
She told him she didn't want to see him anymore. He would spend all day and all night obsessing over her. He pleaded with her for another chance. He promised he would change. He stayed up all night on the computer writing to her. He was constantly up using methamphetamines. He tried desperately to see her, but she avoided him. He'd wait for her calls, but she'd never call. He'd show up at her house and her mom would tell him that she was out of town. The drugs were starting to take its toll on his state of mind. He would describe to his friends that he felt like demons were taking over his body and he couldn't sleep. He was so strung out and heartbroken over his girlfriend. So David Cash became one of his favorite friends, his favorite distraction. He was doing stuff with his life, so Strohmeyer would go along with whatever Cash was up to. When Cash drove up to UC Berkeley late in April to visit the campus, Strohmeyer tagged along, and that's when the pair got matching tongue piercings. And during this trip, Cash got into a car accident with his mom's car. While the car was getting fixed, he stayed with the Strohmeyers for a couple of weeks. As a thank you to the Strohmeyers for their hospitality, Cash's father invited Strohmeyer to go to Las Vegas with them on Memorial Day weekend. Strohmeyer's parents were trying to somehow figure out how to help him get better, more disciplined, and to shape up his behavior. They asked him to go see a therapist, which he did. He was diagnosed as suffering from attention deficit disorder, which is what they felt was causing Strohmeyer's inability to focus. The therapist prescribed dexedrine and amphetamine. I looked up some of the psychological side effects and they include increased alertness, apprehension, concentration initiative, self-confidence, sociability, mood swings, meaning an elevated mood followed by a depressed mood, insomnia or a decreased sense of fatigue, anxiety, changes in libido, grandiosity, irritability, repetitive or obsessive behaviors, and restlessness. Amphetamine psychosis, delusions, and paranoia may occur with heavy or long-term use. Strohmeyer began taking the prescribed medication one week before he went to Nevada with Cash and his father. Later on, after all of this had happened, when Strohmeyer was being investigated, Police discovered that he had logged into the internet and talked about his interest and his fantasies that involved young children. So when he got to the prima donna bathroom that day, this is where Strohmeyer was going to have the chance that he had wanted. He had Charisse in that stall and he would later confess to police in a cold, emotionless details exactly what he did to her. In that stall, he pressed his hand against her mouth and tried to hold her steady because she was squirming. He threatened to kill her if she screamed. He took her boots off and then her underwear, and he violated her. I can't even speak the words. She screamed, so he put his hands around her neck and squeezed. He was suddenly startled by someone coming into the restroom. He quickly sat on Charisse and hid her little body and legs behind him so it would look as though there was only one person in there. He could hear her barely gasping to breathe. She was trying to move, so he placed his hand over her mouth again. He could see through the crack in the door that there were two women in the restroom. When they finally left, Strohmeyer could see that Charisse was barely still alive. Her breathing was very shallow. He 
He would later explain to police that he thought she was brain dead and didn't want to leave her like that, so he tried to break her neck like he had seen it done in the movies by taking her head in both of his hands and twisting it. She still seemed to be breathing, so he snapped at her neck even harder. Once he could see that she was dead, he stuffed her boots and her pants and her underwear in the toilet bowl. He lifted her up and put her legs into the toilet and arranged her in kind of a squatting position and folded her arms over her legs. He told the police that it was like a dream, a dream where he had wanted to experience death, something that he had never been that close to before. He wanted to see death. Using a piece of toilet paper, he wiped a little bit of blood and foam that had come from Sharice's mouth onto his hands, threw it on the floor, and walked out, closed the stall door. Twenty-five minutes after entering the bathroom, Strohmeyer seen in the grainy surveillance video walking out. Cash spotted him and said, Dude, let's go. My dad's waiting. As the two friends were headed towards the exit, Cash asked him what happened. Strohmeyer looked at him and said, I killed her. So, what does Cash do? He presses on with the stupid questions and asks if Sharice was sexually aroused. I don't know if there was ever any answer to that question. Cash is another character in this story that I loathe so badly. The two friends get into Cash Sr.'s car and head towards Vegas, arriving around 7 a.m. on Sunday. The elder Cash went gambling and the boy slept in the car until noon. That day and into the next, Strohmeyer and Cash hung out in Vegas at New York, New York, the Luxor, MGM Grand, and all the while, they talked about what happened to Charisse. They talked about it as if they were in disbelief that it happened. Cash was pretty sure everything was caught on camera, but Strohmeyer didn't seem to think so. But Cash was pretty convinced that they would be caught because they were so conspicuous. They made a pact that they wouldn't tell anyone, and if they were caught, they would just say that they were playing hide-and-seek and the girl locked herself in the stall and they just left. They headed home Monday night. So again, we're asking ourselves, what is the deal with David Cash? The two friends met in a computer class during their junior year. Cash was a science and math whiz. He had nearly a perfect grade point average, and the way he came off about his intellect was a turnoff to most of Strohmeyer's friends. They thought he was a weird hanger-on. In the party circles, Strohmeyer was considered a cool guy, but Cash certainly was not, but he tried his hardest to fit in with the partiers. Strohmeyer looked older. He passed for an adult. He was tall and had a fake ID, and he was a big flirt with the ladies. Cash, on the other hand, was short and baby-faced. He still looked very much like a kid, and he always got carded, and he so badly wanted to fit into Strohmeyer's world. He got his tongue pierced because Strohmeyer did, even though he didn't want to. Until Cash met Strohmeyer, he'd never even gotten drunk. For his first time, the friend used a video camera, which was something that not everybody had at the time like we do now with their phones. Cash drank so many beers that he lost count. Strohmeyer drank so many shots of Cuervo that he had to be carried up the stairs at the Cash house. When they got back that Tuesday early in the morning from their Memorial Day trip to Nevada, Cash slept in, cutting his Tuesday classes. At approximately 5 p.m. that afternoon, he turned on the TV and he saw the surveillance images of himself and Strohmeyer at the Prima Donna Resort and Casino. 
Their images were being splashed all over the local Southern California news. I remember vividly seeing these same news stories that Cash was looking at when all of this went down. I had been to the prima donna several times. We passed by there countless times on the way to Vegas. The tragic news stuck with me because I'd been there. I'd been there since. I think about Charisse every time I see that casino as I cross into Nevada. Suspect number one clearly looked like Strohmeyer, at least to Cash. To me, he looked like any other lanky, blonde Southern California guy. Suspect number two, Cash himself, seemed more difficult to recognize. He wondered if anyone would be able to figure out it was them. The news anchor suddenly stated that the suspects were from Long Beach, California. Cash would say that he felt the color drain from his face like his heart stopped. I actually find it kind of hard to believe that this guy felt anything, but then again, this was him and his BFF was being broadcasted all over Southern California. Fearing for himself getting in trouble? Yeah, I believe that. Cash immediately drove over to the Strohmeyer's place, and he told him that they were on the news. Strohmeyer seemed shocked that the news in Nevada would make its way to the Southern California news stations. This was the time when the internet was still in its infancy. There wasn't social media. Stories like this didn't often make news outside of local areas. It was likely that these two dumbasses figured that the border town news wouldn't make its way the 250 miles to the Los Angeles area. They probably didn't know Charisse was from Los Angeles. Maybe they figured Charisse would be marginalized because she wasn't a John Benet Ramsey or a Kaylee Anthony or a Madeline McCain. Whatever they figured, they figured wrong. Charisse's life meant something, and people were on to them. Strohmeyer turned on the TV in his family's living room. The news anchors were saying that suspect number one had pierced nipples and a pierced tongue, and suspect number two has short brown hair and long sideburns. The two figured they were caught. It was only a matter of time before they were arrested, but only if somebody recognizes them. So they confided in a friend at school, James Trujillo. They arranged to meet with him after school and told him what happened at the prima donna, and they wanted him to look at the news footage and see if he thought that the surveillance images looked like them. James, at the time, didn't really believe them. He would later say that they didn't really seem scared or anxious. They weren't acting like people involved in a brutal killing. When asked by Las Vegas police what he did after he met with Strohmeyer and Cash, he states, I just left, and I kind of really just um, didn't pay attention to it. I was like, oh, well, it's not a big deal, I guess, because of the way Jeremy is. He's the kind of person where, like, he's going to do what he needs to do to get attention. And if he needs to take that, like, far out to the maximum to have people pay attention to him, then he'll do that. James would also go on to say that at no time did he really think, like, oh, yeah, this person killed somebody. I really need to do something about it. Seems to be a common theme amongst these kids in Long Beach. Cash wasn't sure what to do. He didn't want to go to his parents. His mom would burst into tears and his dad would go flying off the handle. So what does he do? He calls their old friend, Jeremy Phillips, who had moved up to Oregon about a month earlier. Phillips urged Cash to turn Strohmeyer in. Cash said that he couldn't do it. Later on in an interview with the Los Angeles Times, Jeremy Phillips was asked why he thought Cash ignored his advice to turn Strohmeyer in. His answer, it's a man thing. If your friend does something really bad or really wrong, you're not going to go out there and narc on them. Now, are you guys thinking what I'm thinking? Is every single teenager in Southern California a complete douchebag? It feels like it, at least in this circle of friends. When Jeremy Phillips was asked why he didn't call police and turn Strohmeyer in, 
He again reaches into his bag of douchery and has this answer. Because I didn't want to get Dave in trouble. I was waiting for Dave to do it. For men, it's like a respect for your male friends. It's like an oath, a pact you take when you become best friends with a guy. <sighs> Phillips continues on and says, I've talked about it with a lot of guys, and what would they do if their best friend killed somebody, and every guy asked so that they wouldn't say anything? Okay, I have to stop here for a minute because it's getting way too thick in here. I discussed this with my husband a couple of days ago. I wanted his perspective. He used to be a stupid teenage male with stupid teenage male friends, and my husband's from Las Vegas, so even better. I asked him, what would you do? You have this friend who you look up to, who you kind of idolize, and you're kind of like the goofy sidekick, and he's this really cool guy and lets you tag along and lets you be his little buddy. And dude goes and follows a young girl into a restroom and pushes her into the stall, and you follow them in there, peer over the door, and you see what's obviously happening do you just walk away and not say anything to your friend? Not say anything to security? You just walk away? My husband's response? I wouldn't have ever set foot into the women's restroom in the first place. And I wouldn't have been friends with anyone who would do that either. And that, my friends, is just about the most decent response you're going to hear throughout this entire story. Later that Tuesday night, one of Cash and Strohmeyer's classmates came home to his mother telling him that Jeremy Strohmeyer's on TV. His mother was bewildered. He had been over to their home a few weeks earlier and was in the jacuzzi. She saw his two nipple piercings. She was certain that this was him. There was no question. That was Strohmeyer on the news and she could tell. He kind of blew his mom off and said, no, no, that wasn't his friend. He went up to his room and called Strohmeyer right away. He denied it, of course. The next day, he confronted Strohmeyer and Cash at school with the morning paper in his hand with the surveillance images splashed all over the front pages, and he asked Strohmeyer, is this you? He said yes, it was him. When asked by the LA Times in an interview, the friend said that he was speechless, like totally blank. Strohmeyer acted normal all day, just like every other day. He said he kept thinking to himself, how could he have done this? There has to be something wrong here. He continues on and says that right when he told him, he wanted to tell someone, but it felt like it would be the right thing to do, just go tell my dad or my mom or something, but I couldn't do it because I didn't know what to do. I was just scared. Later on that same day in history class, Another person remarked that the newspaper picture looked like Strohmeyer. The same friend approached him again later after class and told him that there's a girl in class that thinks he's the murder suspect and asked him what he was going to do. Strohmeyer said he wasn't going to do anything. Yet another student confronted Strohmeyer about it. Carmela Reimer from Anatomy Class. She told him she'd seen him on TV. He confronted her later and told her that they were in Vegas that weekend, but he was innocent. To her, he seemed to be acting weird and paranoid. Strohmeyer and Cash went to Taco Bell on their lunch break that day. Strohmeyer referred to it as his last supper. He knew his time was running out. Everyone at school was recognizing him in that video surveillance, and it was obvious. Cash thought they'd be arrested at school. The Long Beach police did, in fact, visit the school that morning. The assistant principal had called them after two female students had come to the principal's office saying that they knew who the two suspects wanted for Sharice's murder were. Detectives had actually set up surveillance at the Strohmeyer residence that afternoon. There wasn't going to be a big bust at school like they had thought. After school, Strohmeyer bummed a ride off of a former volleyball teammate. They went to Starbucks and hung out for a little bit. Strohmeyer told him that he had strangled the girl but did not mention that he had sexually assaulted her too. 
When this friend was later asked what his reaction was to this, he said he believed him because people don't make this kind of stuff up. And when asked if he had considered calling the police, he said at the time he was grounded and his parents had seen the video, but he didn't want to go up to them and say, oh yeah, mom, my friend, by the way, killed somebody. Is it okay if I go to the police? This volleyball teammate also ran into Cash, who'd made it clear he did not want the word to get around, telling him he knows what he's seen, referring to the video, and to just be quiet about it. But it was too late. In addition to the two girls that had gone to the principal's office, Carmela Reimer, bless her little heart, called police. Back at the Strohmeyer house, under police surveillance, it was obvious he was getting ready to make a run for it. He had a backpack stuffed with shorts, socks, underwear, and t-shirts. He had a duffel bag and a sleeping bag, tennis shoes, and hiking boots at the front door. He would later tell police that he was panicking and he didn't know what to do, and so he was thinking he would take off and get rid of evidence. He revealed that he had already burned up the baseball cap and the clothes that he was wearing the night that he killed Cherise. Police watched the house as Joe Meyer sat on the porch smoking a cigarette, desperately calling people to help him give him a ride to anywhere, to the airport, to the bus station, to the train station, but nobody would come for him. His mom had been out shopping with his sister, so when they pulled up and his mom got out of the car and went into the house, he took off running. His mom found her son's pills empty and a note that apologized for everything. She also smelt the burning odor from her son having burned his clothes in the fireplace. She had no idea what was going on. Police descended upon Strohmeyer and took him into custody. Meanwhile, Cash was navigating his situation with his parents. When his father got home from work that day, he was the one who asked his son if he had seen the images of the suspects wanted for murder. He admitted he did, and he knew it was Jeremy. His dad insisted they go to the police. Cash said that he was scared to go, but figured that even though he didn't do anything, he was afraid of getting in more trouble. Yeah, okay, guy. You didn't do anything is right. You did nothing, and that... Luckily for you, wasn't going to get you in any trouble legally. But morally, Mr. Cash, if you are listening to this, you, sir, are completely bankrupt. I am going to tell everybody who is listening exactly what you did after what you didn't do in a little bit. Cash went to the police. They arrested him and took a mugshot. And he gave a statement, and it implicated Strohmeyer in the killing. It was pretty obvious, based on the minimal amount of time Cash was seen going into the women's restroom, then coming out, that he did not have anything to do with Charisse's death. He was clearly seen on surveillance, hanging around the bathroom, loitering, doing nothing. A whole lot of nothing. While his BFF is in there murdering somebody. But whatever, right? I cannot talk enough about the amounts of nothing that this guy didn't do. Nothing. He did nothing, nothing, nothing. And I just can't get over this. He was free to go home, to go be in his own bed, sleep in his own room that night. But that would be it for him as far as finishing up the last weeks of school. He would no longer be allowed on campus, not for any more classes, not for graduation, not for prom. He was considered highly disruptive and he jeopardized the safety of others on campus. As far as Woodrow Wilson High School was concerned, he could consider himself graduated early. They told him to look for his final report card, his diploma, and his prom refund in the mail. Mm. Bye bye. Cash was furious. As a student, he was impeccable. He wasn't a criminal, right? How dare they treat him like this, right? Well, Mr. Cash, that's your come up bits for doing nothing. He said he was going to sue. Whatever. From what I could see, nothing ever came of that. While Cash was being questioned by the Long Beach police, 
He had more choice things to say. Cash was asked, Did you think about the safety of that little girl? His answer, Um, I'm not sure I thought, you know, what would happen to her or what he was doing to her. Um, I mean, she was being, like, you know, restrained against her will. Police asked him, Didn't you think that was something you should go and report right away? Cash's answer, Um, I probably should have, but I still, I didn't, you know, at that point, I couldn't fathom Jeremy, you know, doing physical harm. Then police asked him, That evening, did Jeremy make any mention in regard to her appearance or sexuality or anything about her? His response, well, nothing serious. I mean, we always joked around. I mean, like, you know, those little girls, you know, are yummy like this and that, but it's always in a joking manner. In an interview with the Los Angeles Times, Cash was asked why he asked Strohmeyer if the little girl was aroused. His answer, I don't know, it's just the way I think. Cash was asked if he asked Strohmeyer why he killed Cherise. His answer, I never asked him why. He never explained. I don't see how there could be an explanation. When asked if he was appalled that his friend said that he killed this little girl, Cash's response, I'm not going to get upset over somebody else's life. I just worry about myself. I'm not going to lose sleep over somebody else's problems. When asked why he didn't turn Strohmeyer into the police, his response? Well, I didn't want to be that person who takes away his last day, his last night of freedom. When asked if he still considers Strohmeyer a friend, Cash's answer, if you can believe this bullshit. Yeah, he didn't do anything to me. I look up to Jeremy just as much as anyone else. I'm going to have to warn you guys that there is more of this interview with David Cash. You can imagine, it doesn't get any better. You almost think he's trying as hard as he can to be as big of a jerk as he possibly can be. Maybe for attention or to get more interviews or deals. I can't think of any other rational reason why a person would say the things he did or act the way he did unless he really is as a massive of an asshole as he sounds, which I could easily believe. Cash did tell the LA Times that he was hoping the sensationalism of Stromae's trial brings him a movie deal. He made no secret of the fact that he was going to try to capitalize off of this whole thing. When he was asked if he was angry with Jeremy, his answer, no. He didn't do anything to me. I miss him as a friend. There's nothing much you can do about that. You gotta move on. He was asked that if he wasn't angry on his account, but what about for his parents having to drag them into all of this? Cash's response? No, they're over it. He was asked about what he thinks of Charisse. Cash's answer? I don't think of it. I don't know her. He's asked if he feels bad for her, and he says, The situation just sucks in general. He's asked if he feels worse for her or for Jeremy, and he states, Well, because I knew Jeremy, I feel worse for him. I know he had a lot going on for him. Ugh, this guy just makes my skin crawl. It's almost unreal. I wouldn't believe it if I didn't actually hear this crap come out of his mouth. There is this interview he did on 60 Minutes. I will play it at the end of the show so you can hear it for yourself that he really is this awful. Charisse was laid to rest on May 31st, 1997 with services at Paradise Baptist Church. Her father sat on one side and her mother on the other. They never spoke to one another after Charisse's death. She's buried at Forest Lawn in Los Angeles. As far as Strohmeyer is concerned, 
He was scheduled to go to trial in September of 1998. He was facing the death penalty if he were convicted on all charges. However, just hours before his trial was to begin, his attorney, Leslie Abramson, entered a plea bargain on his behalf. And if his attorney's name sounds familiar to you, she is familiar. She is the same attorney that defended the Menendez brothers in their first trial. The one with the poofy blonde perm? Yeah, that's her. On September 8, 1998, Strohmeyer pled guilty to four counts. First degree murder, first degree kidnapping, sexual assault on a minor with substantial bodily harm, and sexual assault on a minor. On October 14, 1998, Strohmeyer was sentenced to four life terms, one for each count, to be served consecutively without the possibility of parole. Apparently, he's had the chance to appeal. He's tried to recant his confession and take back his guilty plea, accusing Abramson of bullying him and his parents into confessing unless they paid her more money. His appeals have all been denied. He is currently prisoner number 59389 in Nevada's High Desert State Prison. If you hover over his inmate number, a recent photo of him pops up and he's smiling in it. Sharice's mother, Yolanda Manuel, attempted to have David Cash charged as an accessory, but authorities said that there isn't any evidence connecting him to the crime itself. He was never going to be prosecuted for anything related to Sharice's murder. Technically, it was perfectly legal for him to walk away from what was going on in that bathroom that night and to wait for his friend. There were protests and rallies to have Cash removed from UC Berkeley, where he was accepted to and attended their nuclear engineering program. My husband looked him up recently and he's actually listed on the www.ripoffreport.com website. It says, this company operates in California, but its headquarters and offices are in Texas. Plains Exploration and Production Company, which is one of the largest oil companies in California and even has their own ticker in the New York Stock Exchange, PXP, has hired David Cash Jr. as one of their equipment operators of their company. Cash was lucky to receive this high paying job all thanks to his nuclear engineering degree from the University of California, Berkeley. But one must not forget that in 1997, David Cash witnessed his friend, Jeremy Strohmeyer, rape and strangle to death a seven year old girl by the name of Sharice Iverson. Cash did nothing other than cheer his friend on while he was murdering this little girl. According to the Los Angeles Times, David Cash peered into a stall in a Nevada casino restroom and saw his best friend muffle the screams of a seven-year-old girl with his left hand and fondle her with his right. Cash was in the restroom for two minutes. He did not assist his friend, nor did he hinder him. Cash did not call for help. He just left as his friend shouted at the little girl. According to some of Cash's friends, he bragged to them about witnessing the actual murder. Back then, there was no Good Samaritan law in Nevada. Thus, Cash got off the hook, scot-free, while Jeremy was sentenced to life in prison without parole. The case received national notoriety and attention, and is one of the most highly televised trials of 1998. The article also lists some of the information I gave you guys in the story, particularly his statements to the media and the Los Angeles Times. They also list his cell phone number, his birthday, his email, his Facebook page, his MySpace page, if that's still even a thing, and all of his work contact information, just in case anyone had anything to say about it. Charisse's mother filed a wrongful death lawsuit against the casino and Strohmeyer, and Charisse's father filed one as well, separately, but he is also suing the hotel for slander and defamation because a casino official told reporters that he, shortly after learning of his daughter's death, 
ask them for $100, a hotel room, a plane ticket, beer, and money for Charisse's funeral. The prima donna also filed a cross-claim and a third-party complaint against Mr. Iverson, Strohmeyer, and Cash, alleging that their actions contributed to Charisse's death. Strohmeyer's parents sued the County of Los Angeles over the information about his biological family's mental health issues not being disclosed to them at the time of his adoption. All the cases have been settled for undisclosed amounts. In the wake of Charisse's tragic murder, the state of Nevada immediately made several changes in legislation. Following her death, Clark County passed an ordinance restricting arcade hours for children under 18 and requiring security guards in arcades at all times. Many arcades that formerly stayed open 24 hours began to close at night. In 1998, the Las Vegas Hilton was fined $350,000, the largest fine at the time involving minors, for allowing children to loiter in the casino while they waited in line to ride a Star Trek ride. In addition, Cerise's murder led to the passage of Nevada State Assembly Bill 267 requiring people to report to authorities when they have a reasonable suspicion that a child younger than 18 is being sexually abused or violently treated. The impetus for this bill stemmed directly from David Cash's inaction during the commission of this crime. This, the Sharice Iverson bill, was introduced by Nevada State Assembly Majority Leader Richard Perkins provides for a fine and possible jail time for anyone who fails to report a crime of that nature that led to the creation of the bill. It was enacted in 2000. Charisse's murder also led to the passage of California Assembly Bill 1422 called the Charisse Iverson Child Victim Protection Act. It is a duty to rescue law that requires a person to notify law enforcement if they witness a murder, rape, or any lewd or lascivious act where the victim is under the age of 14. In the stories that I've told so far in California Dreaming, I like to make a point of focusing on the life of the victim. I want to tell their story in a way that won't be forgotten, to honor them, and to walk away with some lessons learned from their individual experience. I hope that I've done that for Charisse. Much of what happened to that beautiful little child were caused by the dynamics and the troubled histories of the people involved in her story. Her father, her mother, her brother, David Cash, the bystander, the casino staff, the security, and of course, the one person who laid his hands on her and violated her in the worst way and ultimately took away her life. He's the one that bears the brunt of the responsibility, but I can't help but be frustrated with her family, Strohmeyer's family, David Cash, the casino security, Collectively, in one way or another, everyone failed Cherise. Some in bigger ways than others, but if anyone at any point in time stepped in when something just wasn't right, Cherise would be in this world with us today. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode of California Dreaming. I know it was such a long story, but I really felt like all of the details involved in it needed to be heard. There's a few things I wanted to talk to you about before I play you that 60 Minutes interview that I told you about. I would first like to give a warm thank you to Eileen W. for being the latest Patreon contributor. Your generosity is tremendously appreciated. And thank you to all of you who continue to support the show, and not just through Patreon, but through spreading the word on social media, interacting and 
discussing and commenting on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You guys are so much fun. And for the latest five-star reviewers on iTunes, Sea Town Soldier, Imes Baloo, Trisha Lynn, Rilke 2012, and B. Monroe 11. Thank you all for taking the time to go in and leave me five stars. I also want to thank you for the Facebook reviews as well. Stephanie and Rob, thank you so much for your five stars there. It helps the show out so very much. All these reviews, it gets the word out and gives us more visibility, so thank you. I also want to remind you that California Dreaming is now proudly a part of the Orbital Jigsaw family of podcasts, an eclectic group of outstanding podcasts from a variety of genres. We have two new shows that joined last week. I managed to tell you about the Is This Adulting podcast, a show dedicated to breaking down the stigma of mental illness through comedy. And I'm super excited to announce to you guys that a podcast I've been listening to for a very long time, even before my own show was even a twinkle in my eye, Insight, hosted by Allie and Charlie. Join them as they take a new look at true crime, mysteries, and forgotten history. And you all know the others in this fantastic podcast family. The Concession Stand, a weekly podcast where hosts Nick and Andy geek out over all things entertainment, or Busted Wide Open, where hosts Nick and Surrey and Dangerous bring you all the hottest news in sports, entertainment, and pro wrestling. Or Super Nerds UK, where hosts Ben, Ian, Tim, and Simon take an irreverent look at pop culture. Or Historium, a podcast devoted to telling strange, obscure, or otherwise interesting stories from history. And the Dirty Bits podcast. Join host Tawny Plattis each week for her casual retellings of the sexy, scandalous, and salacious stories your history teacher likely left out. So if any of these sound good to you, check those out at www.orbitaljigsaw.com. Hey guys, this is Sinead from the Mens Rea Podcast. If you like true crime, and I know you do, check us out to hear about the guilty minds of Ireland and the UK and the court cases that follow. Available wherever you get your podcasts from. And remember, don't do anything I wouldn't do. Thanks. Murder Road Trip is a true crime podcast where I, your host Haley, discuss murder cases in my car, aka the Mobile Beads Lab. Join me and my partner in crime, HH Gnomes, on the road. There will be games, mixtapes, and snacks as I make the research journey to murder scenes around the world. Make sure to check your back seat, and I'll see you at the next rest stop. Hello, skin suits. This is Angel and Ember. Deep down, do you have a secret passion for true crime, sarcasm, inappropriate jokes, but you still want to hear all those lovely details? However, you still need a little bit of humor to get you through those dark moments? Then come hang out with us over at the Color Me Dead podcast. We try to balance both humor and facts perfectly. We also go on some pretty extraordinary squirrel hunts. (laughs) We can be found on iTunes and all other podcast apps. Come over to Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram and see us at Color Me Dead Podcast for the latest updates and gory chat. We release on Wednesdays because on Wednesdays we wear murder. Don't forget to spay and neuter your pets and and stay out of chalk lines. Please don't forget to check out the California Dreaming Patreon page if you'd like to help support the show as well as some causes that are near and dear to us here. You may pledge as little as $1 a month and you can be the proud recipient of a brand new show sticker as well as some future perks I'm hoping to have available soon. You can also help support the show by leaving reviews on iTunes and interacting with me on social media, spreading the word about California Dreaming and the Orbital Jigsaw Network. And lastly, feel free to join me in all the social media fun. Follow me on Facebook at California Dreaming Discussion page, on Twitter at California Pod, and on Instagram at California Dreaming Pod. 
we share all things true crime related and everything else that you want to talk about. And don't forget to listen at the end of this episode for the short 60 minute interview with your favorite bystander, David Cash, the Bad Samaritan. Thank you again, dreamers, and until next time, sweet dreams. Everybody, or almost everybody, is familiar with the story in the Bible of the Good Samaritan who stops to help a wounded man lying by the side of the road. And most of us would like to believe we would do the same. We'd also like to believe that a young college student like David Cash would have been Good Samaritan enough to have stepped in and done something, anything, when he saw another young man, his best friend, assaulting a little girl who minutes later his best friend raped and murdered. But for the past few months, David Cash has been the subject of nationwide outrage over his decision to walk away and not even report the rape and murder of seven-year-old Sharice Iverson. The 19-year-old Cash, a sophomore at the University of California at Berkeley and a nuclear engineering major, has become an outcast on campus. We want Cash out! We want Cash out! Many of his fellow students there are demanding the university expel him. They are infuriated not only by his failure to save Sharice Iverson, but also by remarks he made this summer on a Los Angeles radio program. How much am I supposed to, to sit down and cry about this? I mean, I mean, let's be reasonable here. Is my life supposed to halt for, like, for days, weeks, and months on end? And if that weren't bad enough, he added this. The simple fact remains, I do not know this little girl. I do not know starving children in Panama. I do not know, you know, people that die of disease in Egypt. Some people have called you the, the bad Samaritan. You think that's an appropriate name? No, most certainly not. They, they're, these names that people call me, I've been called the antithesis of today's teens, you know, bad Samaritan, a, te a textbook sociopath. Uh, I've been called it all. David Cash's trouble started just before he enrolled at Berkeley. One night last year, his father took him and his best friend Jeremy Strohmeyer, seen together in this home video, to a casino near Las Vegas. Surveillance cameras there showed the two boys playing video games at 3.30 in the morning. Strohmeyer then spots Sharice Iverson, whose father was gambling nearby. The cameras record Sharice walking into a women's restroom followed by Jeremy Strohmeyer, and then, a minute later, by David Cash. When I entered the bathroom, Jeremy Strohmeyer and, and Sharice Iverson were throwing paper towels at each other. You know, they were just playing, you know, seemed to twerk around. And it came to a point where Jeremy grabbed her and took her into a stall, to one of the bathroom stalls. I went to the adjacent stall, looked over, and Jeremy was restraining her with his left hand over her stomach and his right hand over her mouth. And she was trying to scream. He was muffling her screams. Cash says he then heard Strohmeyer threaten Sharice Iverson, saying, shut up or I'll kill you. And I tapped him on the head, you know, because it was completely out of character. And he didn't, really he, didn't, you know, he didn't really respond to me. He gave me kind of a blank stare. So, you know, in my opinion, you know, it was like time for me to get out of there. Why? Yeah. Well, when it... 18-year-old male grabs a 7-year-old child, you know, that's not, that's not a position I want to be in. Based on what I saw, I mean, it wasn't something I wanted to stick around and, and see what would materialize. Did you say to him, Jeremy, come on, stop, let's go? I was giving him a look as if, you know, you know, that he shouldn't be doing that. But you never said, stop, get out of here, this is wrong. Verbally, I did not say that, but my body language certainly suggested it. According to the surveillance cameras, David Cash walked out of the bathroom about two minutes after he entered. Strohmeyer was seen leaving some 22 minutes later. But Sharice Iverson never left. Her body was discovered in the bathroom. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled. What did he say to you when he came out? He, he immediately confessed. Confessed? Yes. What did he say? He looked at me and said, I, I killed her. Just like that? Just like that. After Strohmeyer confessed to Cash that he had killed Sharice Iverson, they went to other casinos where they played slot machines and rode roller coasters for several hours before heading back home to California. 
Did you think to turn him into the police? The thought crossed my mind, but, but I didn't act on it. Why? I know that his day of reckoning is coming. I didn't, I didn't want to be the one that, that turned him in. You felt that was more important than to report a murderer? Even though he had told me that he had committed murder, it was really hard for me to fathom Jeremy as a quote-unquote murderer. But he told you he was. I understand that, but he's, he's also my best friend. You know, we're taking AP English together. But after Cash and Strohmeyer returned home, friends who had seen the surveillance tapes played on the local news tipped off police. Strohmeyer was charged with murder, and three weeks ago, to avoid the death penalty, he pled guilty. He is now serving life in prison without parole. But David Cash, who watched as Strohmeyer physically assaulted a little girl just minutes before she was murdered, has not been charged with any crimes. He's evil! He's evil! Yolanda Manuel is Sharice Iverson's mother. She is estranged from Sharice's father and was not at the casino with him the night of the murder. She has collected 20,000 signatures urging prosecutors to charge Cash with a crime. He seen Jeremy Strohmeyer put his hands over her mouth and carried her in the bathroom. He seen it. Anytime you stand and you look at something happening to anybody, not only a child, any human being, a dog, a cat, or whatever, you seen that happen. So you are murdered within yourself. You still got the blood of my babies on your hand. You think he is an accessory to murder? Yes, he is. I think he should be charged with accessory to the murder of my child because... He could have did something to stop it. He didn't do anything. Peggy Lean is the deputy district attorney in Nevada, whose office made the decision not to bring charges against Cash. How would you characterize the, the conduct of David Cash on this case? Morally reprehensible. And it is uh, unfathomable that someone could see uh, conduct of that nature and not take some form of action. Why then didn't your office charge him with any crime? Moral reprehensibility isn't a crime. Uh, you have to participate, do something affirmatively to assist in the commission of a crime. Uh, watching and failing to report, regrettably, is not a crime. But, I mean, isn't there something wrong with that? I mean, you've got someone who could have saved a child's life and who did nothing about it, and yet there's no way to hold him accountable. There may not be any way to hold him legally accountable. He's certainly accountable in the court of public opinion, and he's certainly accountable ultimately in how people respond to his uh, morally bankrupt behavior. We asked David Cash to explain his behavior to a group of fellow students we assembled on the campus of Berkeley, and he agreed. A lot of people say, you know, how come you didn't, st come you didn't stop the murder, how come you stopped the rape? You know, I, didn't, I, I never felt that this was going to happen to her. If I thought that, you know, that was going to happen, of course I would have stopped it. You know, I don't, I, don't, I don't want this on my conscience that, you know, oh, you know, I, I allowed, you know, somebody to die. Is it on your conscience? Not to the extent that yes most people... Yes or no, is it on your not conscience? Not to the extent that most people would want it to be. Yes or no? Not to the extent that most people would want it to be. Okay. I really have a hard time believing that you thought that nothing wrong was going on. Yeah, Doesn't no it chance. alarm you that for 25 minutes he's still in the bathroom with a seven-year-old girl? I mean, that's just not a normal occurrence, and yet wouldn't you want to well, go okay, back okay, in there? Well, okay, let's think of that. Let's say after 25 minutes I come to the conclusion that he's murdered this girl, all right? Do I storm into the bathroom, you know, and then what, what happens to me? Okay, let's say a security guard walks in, you know, I'm sitting here, you know, with my best friend with the dead body there. You know what I mean? I think it's very clear to all of us that David Cash's mindset was, what is best for me? What is going to get me, keep me out of trouble? You have expressed no remorse, no feeling that you felt bad at all that this young girl was murdered. How is it that you can sit there and feel comfortable with yourself waiting three days when you could have assisted the police in pursuing Jeremy Howard? You, you could have done any number of things, but you did nothing. It's easy for you people to say, oh, well, you should have done this, you should have done that. Like, you didn't know Jeremy. But, you know, at the time, I made the best possible decision. You still stood by and let a little girl be raped and killed, and I don't think we should stand by and let you get Wait, away okay, with that. Okay, you just said I stood by and let a little girl get raped and killed. Yeah. That is wrong. I did not see that. I did not witness that. I did not know that was happening. So how David Cash was unable to convince these students that he belongs at Berkeley. They say they want him out. Do you have any attention of leaving? No, I did not. That would be foolish. Why? Berkeley is one of the best engineering schools in the, in the, in the country. You know, why would I leave? You know, that, that would be stupid. A number of students say that they're going to take matters into their own hands and, 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 in essence, run you out of here. Can they? They will fail. 
I'm, I have no intention of leaving. Despite the uproar on campus, Berkeley Chancellor Robert Berdahl says he cannot expel Cash because he hasn't committed a crime and he hasn't broken any university rules. David Cash has done reprehensible uh, things in not acting, I think, to intervene. He said outrageous things. Uh, but even when students act in an outrageous fashion, we can't simply take an arbitrary action against them on the basis of, of some kind of moral outrage that, that people feel. Does the university have a moral responsibility to do something about students who behave so atrociously? What has offended the community sensibilities, I think, are, are the things that he has said. Berkeley is, uh, for better or worse, the home of the free speech movement, and, and we are not about to punish uh, students simply for exercising the, the right of free speech, no matter how outrageous and objectionable things they may say. What David Cash did, or did not do in this case, is perfectly legal, not just in Nevada, but in nearly every state. But the conduct of Cash has prompted legislation calling for a Good Samaritan law, which would require citizens who witness a sexual assault or other violent crime against children to report it to the police. Surprisingly, it does not have the support of many in law enforcement, including the prosecutor in the Cherie Syverson case. Uh, should we as a society punish this as a crime? It, it's basically an attempt to legislate morality. And historically, we haven't been very successful in our efforts to legislate morality from prohibition to prostitution. You can tell somebody not to do it, you can regulate it, you can punish it. But ultimately, it doesn't do a very good job of uh, changing the conduct. Cherise Iverson's mother disagrees with the prosecutor. Yolanda Manuel says a good Samaritan law is the only way to punish the David Cashes of the world. David Cash needs to be locked up. I want his education taken away from him. My child would not be able to go on with her education. She was seven years old. She would not be able to go to junior high. She would not be able to go to high school or college and beyond. Have you ever said anything that would say, Miss Manuel, I'm sorry about what happened. I wish there was something I could have done. Have you ever expressed that to her? No. Maybe not in those exact words, but you have it. No, but I mean, that, that's definitely a good idea that I definitely should. A, a year and a half later, yeah, it is kind of a good idea. Mm -hmm. You disgust me, seriously. Like, it's taking all my energy to sit here and sit in front of your face. Mm -hmm. But yeah. You know, the simple fact is there, there's one person that killed Trace Iverson. There's one guy, Jeremy Stromeyer. And there's one other person who could have stopped it. Technically, I could have stopped it, but based on what I saw, I didn't, feel like, I didn't feel her life was in danger. If you could go back to that night and do it all over again, what would you do differently? I don't feel there's much I could have done differently.